Okay, so yeah, just uh, if you wouldn't mind kind of describing, you know, uh, what the reason and the intention behind the oxygen advantage is. Um, my reasoning was is to, is to introduce breathing in terms of high performance in sports. It's the one thing that was always overlooked. If you think of what sets the limits of endurance and what sets the limits of intensity, oftentimes it was the person's breathing. It was the, the disproportion of breathlessness. It was the intensity of breathlessness that was setting the limits of physical ability. But yet everything was being trained except breathing. And breathing is what influences the amount of oxygen delivered to the muscles. So here you have athletes that are training every part of their body um, and they have a team of specialists around them. Like even if I work with an Olympic athlete, every facet of that activity, you know, with that athlete is, is being monitored except breathing. And even in a number of things, it's through the breath. And this is what I was hoping to impart with the oxygen advantage that we have an idea out there that the more air we breathe, the better. And that's not necessarily true. And um, we also fail to consider that the respiratory muscles are prone to fatigue and up to 50% of athletes can experience respiratory muscle fatigue. And when the respiratory muscles fatigue, blood is stolen from the legs to feed the diaphragm. So it's ultimately breathing that's going to dictate, um, you know, everything else. And that's my whole point of it. And it's also sleep and the emotions, you know, we need athletes to be waking up feeling very refreshed. We need good sleep for a good recovery. Um, but, but I would say that at least 50% of athletes wake up with a dry mouth in the morning. And if you're sleeping with your open, with an open mouth during, if you have your mouth open during sleep, you're, you're likely to wake up feeling unrefreshed. And even when I look at, I look at some athletes in press conferences and I look at how they are breathing. And during the press conference, they're breathing upper chest and they're breathing hard. And I know these guys are going to gas out too soon. But again, you know, they fail. It's often overlooked that our everyday breathing is, is influencing our breathing during exercise. So that's what I wanted to introduce by the book. You mentioned uh, sleeping with your mouth open being problematic. Yes. Uh, why is that problematic? Is that, is that stealing, you know, some of our quality of sleep? Yeah, you, you, you tend to have light sleep. So it's, it's been, you know, it's been researched probably not as often as it should do. Um, but we know that people who are prone to obstructive sleep apnea, it really increases dramatically when the mouth is open. Now you think of your weightlifting guys. They're big guys and they have a wide circumference of a neck and those guys are going to be more prone to obstructive sleep apnea. And this is when there's collapse of the upper airway during sleep. So you might, you know, the person might be snoring and the next thing is they stop breathing. But the problem is with that is that it puts the heart under pressure. And if you, ha if you're an athlete and you're putting your heart under pressure during the day, um, nighttime is a time for the heart to recover. You don't mm. want to be putting the heart under stress during sleep because, you know, that sets up, it's a recipe for disaster. So, so for sleep, Stanford research, Stanford medical school did recently did research about two months ago and they got a group of individuals and they purposely blocked their noses for 10 days, both during wakefulness and sleep. And their sleep was adversely affected. But we would know that, you know, there's, there's quite a lot of research showing that sleep disorder breathing, including sleep apnea and snoring increases during open mouth breathing. But uh, light sleep is more, is, is much, as just as much of an issue with it. So nowadays, I mean, when I was a kid playing soccer, you always heard the coach say, you know, when you're sprinting and you're running, breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. Yes. Is there any merit or any benefit of in through the nose and out through the mouth? Or are, are, as athletes, are we just trying to keep it all through the nose? And um, for, say, if I'm working with recreational athletes, I will always advocate for a recreational athlete to nasal breathe all the time. Mm. It's more efficient. Now, it depends on race, to be honest with you as well. And um, so, say, for instance, if you're African-American, you have a better facial structure and um, you'll tend to have wider nostrils and you're better able to handle air through your nose versus Caucasian like myself. I've got very pinched nostrils. So anatomically, I'm not in a good place in terms of doing that. So it, if you have an athlete with a good broad facial structure and forward development of the jaws, you know, and they've got a good airway anatomically, and this is what we want athletes to be. 
um, it's better it's better that you will be able to to handle that larger volume of air. But if it's an elite athlete, I'll try and get them breathing through the nose for about 50% of the time. I'm using the nose to add an extra load onto them. Um, so, you know, even though it feels a little bit restrictive, nasal breathing does when you switch from mouth, mouth breathing to nose breathing, it feels more restrictive, but that's the training load. If you, if you think about it, if the two of you now look down at your chest, so if you look down at your chest and if you take a breath through your mouth, what part of the body are you moving? The chest, yep. So that's the chest is mouth breathing is directly activating the chest. But if we think of the shape of the human lungs, the greatest concentration of blood is down the lower parts. So if you have an individual that's going for a run, they're breathing hard and fast using their upper chest, but they're breathing air into the top part of the lungs. But the greatest concentration of blood is in the lower part. So it's inefficient in terms of the oxygen transfer from the from the lungs to the blood. So we know that there's a 10 to 15 percent increase in oxygen uptake in the blood by breathing through your nose. So the quality of the breath is different. It's slower and deeper versus faster and shallow. So mouth breathing is fast and shallow breathing. Nose breathing is slow and deep. And nose breathing has an advantage in terms of oxygen uptake versus mouth breathing. We have about 80,000 thoughts per day <laughs> and about 95 percent of them are repetitive and useless. And here is the thing. We, we don't pay attention too often what we're thinking about. The human mind is the filter through which we experience life. But yet we never ask, how does my mind work? What am I thinking about? We seldom pay attention to the patterns of thoughts. Somebody did something to us 10 years ago. They did it to us once and we are doing it to ourselves ever since. If you were married to your own mind, you'd probably have them divorced in about two weeks. <laughs> so I want to see the functioning of my mind. And I don't mean about writing a PhD on how the mind works. Many people write a PhD on how the mind works. That's not what it's about. You could write a PhD on how an apple tastes, or you could bite into the apple. I want to bite into the apple. So in terms of you know, we have to give ourselves some attention. I'm taking my attention out of my mind, onto my breath, feeling the airflow coming in and out of the body, slowing down breathing. It brings the body into relaxation. And also it develops a muscle. I don't know how to explain it, but the mind is neuroplasticity is that the brain changes itself due to new experiences and behaviors. And now if I'm in a situation, I can automatically bring my attention to that part of the brain, hold my attention there, and it gives me the capacity to focus if life throws something at me. I don't get stressed very often. And if you think of it, a pilot that's up in the sky, that pilot is trained to fly, but that jet will fly by itself. That pilot is there when things go wrong. That's why he's there. The athlete that differentiates itself from another athlete is the athlete who can deliver when things are going wrong. It's not when things are going right. And this is where the mind kicks in. Any athlete who can deliver when things are going wrong has got the focus and the capacity to have their full attention on doing what they're doing. Most athletes will buckle and they buckle not because they're not able to do it, but because they don't have the focus of the mind to do it. They say that that's what separated Michael Jordan out from everybody else is that he, you know, he was like, I, I get paid to score points. I'm supposed to score points. So if I score 40 points in the game, it's no matter, right? If I get 10 yeah. rebounds, like I'm supposed to do that. I'm supposed to get assists. I'm supposed to do this. But what I'm not supposed to do is turn the ball over. I'm not supposed to miss shots. I'm not supposed to miss free throws. So he focused in, he honed in on a lot of the things that are that most people are kind of missing. They're not mindful of of some of those uh, other aspects of like this is probably where you're uh, going wrong. And like you know, nobody was better like when the game was on the line and when things were going wrong and things seemed like they were a pure disaster, you know, than him. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. I don't want to take up any more uh, any more of your time, but uh, we will cross paths at some point. I'm going to make sure it happens, whether I go out to Ireland and see you or 
we end up uh, crossing paths here in the States, it will happen at one point or another because you're, you're a fantastic guest, a fantastic mind, and just appreciate you sharing your knowledge and, and putting out books like this. I mean, this is a huge deal, and I don't think enough people are, are talking about it. So uh, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. No, It's because you have that, that great African-American or Nigerian <laughs> bone this is structure. Where the large, yeah. the fat nose. You got that big yes. cold air intake. <laughs> <laughs> that was oh, awesome I'm, I'm glad we got Patrick on the here, African American advantage <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be in Seema's book it's just going to have a giant cock on the front of it <laughs> oh, oh my god, god. <laughs> this is what happens when you podcast for too long <laughs> Oh man, dude! Well, there go the tears. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, peeps, we're out of here. Strength is never weakness. Uh, weakness is never strength. Later. Peace. <laughs>